Thank you very much. Um, as I as he said, we the geologic the GANG, the Geologic Association of New Jersey, has a field trip every year, and it's on various aspects of the geology of New Jersey. And one of the problems with New Jersey is it's such a heavily populated area, you can't go to a lot of outcrops anymore. And so we decided to do it on the Delaware River because there's a lot of information on the geology of the Delaware River. So we rented the um, Spirit of Philadelphia and mostly it's geologists who have walked through the woods for a half an hour or 45 minutes to get to an outcrop. Well, boy, you walk 15 feet, get on the deck of the Spirit of Philadelphia and I invited my wife, as did many other men and women, birth of wives and husbands, and they get on this linen table. There's a, a cash bar. They were loving it. They thought this was the best field trip in the world. You don't have to. You can just stand on carpets and look out the window. And so I'm, I'm, I asked the captain of the boat, I said, can we make it from Philadelphia to the Burlington Bristol Bridge? He said, absolutely not. He said, we're going to go about a mile north of the uh, Betsy Ross Bridge, and we'll turn around and we'll come back. And that'll be our four-hour trip. I said, yeah, but the boat goes seven miles an hour and the tide's coming in, so that's seven. So we can go 14 miles an hour and get 14 miles or 20 miles up there. He said, no. So I started my lecture while the boat's leaving the harbor and we get underneath the Betsy, not the Betsy Ross, the... Ben Franklin Bridge, and the steward comes up. He says, the captain wants to speak to you. I went up there. And the captain said, we've been on this river for 15 and 20 years, and we've never heard this talk on the geology of the Delaware River. We're pushing the boat as hard as we can. And they brought us within a half a mile of the Burlington Bristol Bridge. It was an absolutely delightful trip. You need me to speak a little louder? Okay. And so that was that was the the, the introduction for this talk. Um, oops, wrong direction. So the topics we're going to cover on this are the basics in river flow and the Delaware River today. Then I'm going to talk about Delaware River flow from 500 years ago to about 800,000 years ago during the nine Pleistocene eras of glacial interglacial cycles. And then I'll talk about 200 years ago to present. That was the industrial revolution. And then we'll talk about the precursors to flow in the lower Delaware Valley, the Pinsakan era river and the Bridgeport era river. And then we'll talk about rivers well before the Delaware was even considered a river. And then we'll summarize. So the Delaware River, I just want to take a look at what you're seeing. Good. The Delaware River, we can, this is the Delaware River Basin, which is in obviously starts at New York State up in the Catskills. And it flows, it's the boundary between Pennsylvania and New York. And then it becomes the boundary between Pennsylvania and New Jersey. And it discharges into Delaware Bay. And that discharges into the Delaware, into the Atlantic Ocean. So this is the, all the, the rainfall that falls in this light blue area will eventually make its way, for the most part, to the Delaware River. And we can break the Delaware River up into three sections. The northern section is a non-tidal section. It's fresh water. The section from Trenton to the Delaware Memorial Bridge, traditionally, is tidal and it's freshwater flow. It's an estuary. The definition of an estuary is a tidal freshwater river. And then from the Delaware Memorial Bridge out to Cape Henlope and Cape May, it's tidal and saltwater. So those are the three parts of the Delaware River. I was asked if I could talk about the geologic history of the tributaries Frankfurt to Coney Creek, Pity Pack Creek, and Poquessing Creek, and possibly Wissahickon and the Chamonix Creek. I cannot. Those the I could talk about the geology, but
But to talk about the hydrogeology, I could wing it, but you don't want me winging it. My geology career is in New Jersey. I understand enough in theory about Pennsylvania, and I could, but it would have taken me hours to put this together. I would prefer to put it off to a later time. So I can't speak with geologic certainty, but I'm just gonna show you the area that you're talking about, Neshaminy Creek, Wissahickon Creek, and the other little creeks, they would all fill up that area just north of Philadelphia on this map. So it's just a, a postage stamp area in a large river basin. And so you're gonna have to just kind of remember the area between Trenton and Philadelphia is the area that's of interest to you. That's where we are right now. And this group is hails from this area, but I won't be talking about this area in specifics. So how does a river get its water? How does flow come in there? Well, there's two types of rivers. There's gaining streams and losing streams. And a gaining stream is in an area with wet climate. A losing stream is an area in a dry climate. So rain falls down on the land around here. The trees get their first grab at it. The plants get their first. And the excess water percolates into the ground. And then it flows as groundwater. And then it discharges into the bottom of the river. So the rain that falls on the Delaware River, well, that's recharge. Rain that falls in the ground and then makes it to Pennypack Creek or Nishamany Creek, it'll eventually flow to the Delaware River. But most of the Delaware River is groundwater discharge that flows up through the bottom sands and muds in the bottom of the river. So if you walk along the Delaware River at low tide, you'll see thousands of little springs and they're all tiny springs, less than a gallon per minute. But when you have thousands of less than a gallon per minute springs, that's how the water gets there. And so the river will flow for 90 days with zero rain, just because this groundwater is constantly upwelling into the bottom of the river. So that's how the Delaware River gets most of its water. In a losing stream, if you go to the streams in Nevada, Arizona, the, the, the snow or rain falls up on the top of a mountain, and that stream goes down the flank of the mountain, and then it gets out into the plain, and the stream disappears. That's a losing stream, and it disappears, A, because it, water percolates into the aquifer, but it evaporates also. So the Delaware River is a gaining stream. It gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger as you go further and further downstream. So how does a stream like the Delaware gain water? Obviously precipitation is the main source of all the water. Overland flow from tributaries cause gains. Groundwater flow is springs, that's a gain. But it also gets water from wastewater disposal. Your sewage treatment plants dump that water into there. And because of the saltwater intrusion, we have a number of reservoirs up in the Poconos in the uh, mountains of Northern New Jersey. And those water, those reservoirs release water during the summertime to prevent the saltwater front to move up into there. So that's how the, this river gains water. It loses water via evaporation, surface water withdrawal. So Philadelphia takes its water right out of the Delaware River. Groundwater withdrawals, places like Trenton, Bristol, they have wells and they pull the water out of the wells while the well is stealing the water from the Delaware River. And interbasin transfers, things like the De Delaware Raritan Canal that takes water out up at Bull Island, moves it down to Trenton, and then moves it to the Raritan River. So you're losing water via that way. So we're gonna talk about Delaware River flow before major human activity. So from about 500 years ago, William Penn came here about 500 years ago to about 800,000 years ago. 
I'm not going to put a fine pencil point on these numbers. 800,000 is a good enough number. And we're going to talk about the nine cycles of Pleistocene glacial interglacial periods. So the Pleistocene goes from about 12,000 years ago to around 2.6 million years ago. But the part that goes from about 11,000 years ago, 12,000, to about 800,000 years ago is when the nine glacial cycles occurred. And that's the period of time we're going to be looking at compared to the whole period of time of the period or the uh, time scale of the Earth. So this is the 800,000 years. And you can see the yellow areas are the warm interglacial periods. And the blue areas are the cold glacial periods. And so you have these 100,000 year cycles of warm, cold, warm, cold, warm, cold. And they happen nine times during the last 800,000 years. And each one is about 100,000 years long. We're obviously on the extreme right-hand side of that. That's a recent. And that we're in the recent warm period. The glacial period just before us was called the Wissahick or the Wisconsin glacial period. The warm period about 100,000 years ago was called the Sagamonian. And then before that, all the other blue, the other cold airs were called the Illinoisan or pre Illinoisan glacial periods. And you could see that this is, we're in one of the normal high warm periods and the cold periods are much longer and but they're not much colder now i can break this flow up into an interglacial maximum or a glacial mean or a glacial interglacial transition zone or a glacial mean or a glacial maximum and obviously during the glacial maximum it is cold out there and the flow in the Delaware River is for the most part non-existent because there's glaciers up in Metuchen, New Jersey and the flow just doesn't I mean there's just not enough moisture there's not enough warmth for the water to be water and so this area is predominantly frozen ground it's tundra it's like having rivers in Antarctica you don't see rivers in Antarctica the interglacial maximum is when sea level was at its peak. We're sort of in the interglacial mean right now. And so the flow in the Delaware River in this region is tidal. It's fresh water. In the interglacial maximum, it would be tidal, but it would be saltwater flow in the Delaware River in this location. At the glacial interglacial period, the Delaware River would be a non-tidal stream. And so it would just be like going up to Lambertville, just non-tidal. At the glacial mean, it's non-tidal, it's all fresh water. And flow is always from the mountains to Delaware Bay. At the glacial maximum, we've got glaciers up in northern New Jersey. And those glaciers are so heavy, they've pushed down on the earth. And by pushing down on the earth, flow in the summertime is towards the glacier. So flow in the northern part of the Delaware River is northward, not southward. So we're going to look at 12, the next 20, the last 24,000 years. So this red line that says 12, 11,700, double the width of that little zone there. For, so we're just going to look at from today's warm to that low blue, just on the other side of the line. And that's this period right here. So from 24,000 years ago to today, the flow or the glaciers, we were in a glacial cold period, and then there's the start of the warm period. Now we're in the glacial warm period. You can see that the, the sea level, sea level change in feet has been roughly at 
where it is zero today for the last five, 6,000 years. Let's put this in human perspective. There were no humans living in the Delaware Valley 12,000 years ago, 20,000 years ago. About 10 to 12,000 years ago, the Paleo Indians moved into the valley because it's warm enough now to move into this area. From 4,000 to 10,000 years ago, the Archaic Indians were living in this valley. And from 450 years ago to about 4,000 years ago, the woodland period Indians were living in here. So these blocks of uh, Native Americans, which are living in this area, they're living in the warm cycle. They're, there's nobody living here during the cold cycle. And you can see that sea level was around 20 feet below sea level, or Lancer, the, the ocean was about 20 feet deeper or shallower, um, or 60 feet, 20 meters, 60 feet deeper, when the Indians first move here for the woodland period. Well, Delaware Bay is only about 35 feet deep. So the Indians were living immediately adjacent to a river, not a bay. So most of the middens and those type of features that you're looking for the Indians living at that time, you'd have to go to the center of Delaware Bay to find those homesteads that they had set up. And you go back to the uh, to the Paleo Indians. Now we're dealing with 200, 240 feet below sea level. You have to go 20, 30, 40, 50 miles off the coast of Atlantic City just to have them be close to the shoreline. So we we'll want to put these numbers in perspective for you, what we're dealing with geologically and time sequence for humans. So the picture on the left-hand side is Delaware Bay today. During the glacial maximum, only that dark blue area would potentially be the Delaware River. Obviously, the one that goes up to Newcastle and Wilmington is the actual stream. These are older stream channels. But most of Delaware is dry land. Delaware Bay is dry land. It's very cold at this time and the low sea level. You kind of kind of think if you've ever seen the TV shows about Antarctica, at this period of time, there's things called catabatic winds going from Hudson Bay to middle New Jersey. It's just ice. There's not valleys. There's not. So it's, the wind is just blowing off of that. And if you see Antarctica today, there's very, very stiff winds. They're called catabatic winds coming off of Antarctica. And it is tremendously windy environment. There's the, the old, the waves are just remnant. So the winds in this time would have been just tremendously cold area. Of course, during the gla last glacial man, uh, maximum, during the Sagamonian, Delaware Bay is flooded. Cape May Peninsula doesn't exist. Cape Henlopen doesn't exist. They're all underwater. Sea level is 16 feet higher. So you go back and forth, back and forth with sea level doing this every 100,000 years. And if you look at it today in the previous interglacial cycles, and that was just for Delaware Bay. This just reminds you of where we are. This has been the, during the interglacial maximum when sea level flooded much of Long Island, certainly the coastline of New Jersey, Cape May City, Cape May Peninsula, and much of the shoreline of the Delaware River, the lower Delaware River, and the area from Trenton to the Scudders Falls Bridge, that would have been your tidal freshwater zone. This area from Trenton to, to Cape May would be a tidal saltwater river. And from Scudders Falls Bridge to northern New Jersey would have been a non-tidal freshwater river. So you go... And then 
you have the glacial maximum. There's the glacier up in Metuchen. One of my good friends was from Metuchen and uh, we always made fun of him. We kept on saying that the, the government of Metuchen was so powerful in the seven, in 17,000 years ago that they legislated that the glacier couldn't overrun them. And he never got the joke. So um, with the, the gl glaciers going through northern New Jersey, just a little north of Easton, coming, dipping down into the Hudson Valley into Metuchen, of course, the dry land, you go to the shore now, you have to go another 50, 100 miles east to get into the Atlantic Ocean. And so the Delaware Basin, because the glacier's up there, there's no source of water, the Delaware Basin has changed its shape. And so the amount of flow that's in the Delaware River is radically different. And flow from um, just north of Trenton towards the Atlantic Ocean is all towards the south. But flow, when you get close to the glacier, because it was so heavy, now flow is north to Delaware towards the to the glacier because the glacier has depressed the land in that area. This is a geologic map of New Jersey. And again, I tried to preface you with the geol New Jersey is a small state. So the geologists can cover this. They can drive the whole length of the state in two hours. You try to get to Pittsburgh and it's a six hour drive to get to Pittsburgh from here. So the geology of New Jersey is finally divided up. The geology of Pennsylvania is not finally divided up. And if it is, because I didn't spend a great deal of time studying the geology of New Jersey, I just don't know those references. But if you look at this map, you can see where the um, Pennsylvania Turnpike is running. Yeah, you can see where the Pennsylvania Turnpike. And that pink band and the band below that, that's the Wissahickon Strip. Those are all 500 million year old rocks. That green band, which is all spotted across Philadelphia and goes up towards Trenton, that is the Pensacon and Bridgeton formations. To look at Pencil to New Jersey, the pink area that's all in the Morris River Basin, or the pink area that's to just to the northeast of downtown Trenton, that's the Pensacon and the Bridgeton formations. And if you look at the area uh, where Tullytown is, just across the street from across the river from Trenton and, and uh, Bordentown, that's all the Trenton gravel. And if you look in New Jersey, that orange sediment that's at the same bend in the river just south of Trenton, that's all the Trenton gravel. They have another name in New Jersey. There's a there's an issue called state line fault. So the geologists of Pennsylvania and the geologists of New Jersey don't have to agree. So they call them state line fault. But these are the differences in the geology. So if we look at the inundation of the sediments that were deposited during the Sagamonian, this is those sediments all covered up. You see these yellow sediments along the shoreline of the Delaware River. Those are all Cape May sediments, those yellow and light green sediments. And you can flood those just like this by just covering them up. And that's those were all deposited during the Sagamonian or earlier sedimentary things. So that's just showing you that the flow in the Delaware River has changed over time. If you take a look today at the mean interglacial show, shoreline, this is what it looks like. But if you look at the glacial maximum, that white area to, in the upper right-hand corner is all glacial material. And the flow coming off that glacier melting are those blue lines. But you can see that the brown on the east side of this map, that's all dry land. So flow is going from what used to be the Hudson River out towards the ocean, and flow is coming off of the glacier during the spring melts, and they're feeding the Delaware River. And when those flow come, 
they create the Trenton gravels. They call them sometimes the Spring Lake deposits. They call them the Van Skyver Lake deposits. But nonetheless, these are great glacial maximum when the glacier melts in the springtime. Now you have to imagine when the glacier hits a spring melt and that glacier starts going back two, three miles, that's a phenomenal amount of water. And there's boulders over in, I live in Florence, New Jersey. There's boulders in, in Florence that are size of a washing machine that are just sitting in farm fields. How does a boulder that large get moved from the Trenton area or north of the Trenton area. And you have to think that these, this is not water moving these boulders. This is something equivalent to mayonnaise moving these boulders. You can take a pebble and just set it on mayonnaise, a jar of mayonnaise, and it's not going to sink to the bottom. You take a pebble and you put it in a glass of water, it's going to sink to the bottom. So this sediment coming off the glacier has a great the water has a great deal of sediment within it. And because it is so rich with sediment, it's able to pick up pebbles and cobbles and boulders and flow those along with them. And so if you walk along the Delaware River, you're gonna see, find a lot of pebbles that are the size of your finger. The Delaware River can't move pebbles like that. But during the glacial period, there was so much mud in the, in the water. It was really mud flows that are coming down here and they can move pebbles and bubble, cobbles and boulders. So if we take a look at the present 11,000 years ago and 10, 17,000 years ago, presently we've got Delaware Bay and Chesapeake Bay to the south of us and the Hudson Canyon to the north of us between Long Island. But 11,000 years, that's when the glacier's up by Montreal. Um, the, to, get to, Atlantic, to get to Atlantic City, you'd still be on dry land. You'd still have to go an additional 60 miles from Philadelphia just to get to the shoreline. 17,000 years ago to get to the shoreline, you'd have to go twice the distance from Philadelphia to Atlantic City. You'd have to go about 180 miles Further, further than it, you have to go to today. So the, the glacial interglacial norm for this area is salt water is, can't read it on my thing. Salt water, you have a salt water tidal bay, depositional. We have in 11,000 years ago, 11,000 years ago, um, it was a glacial interglacial period. This area was forested. 17,000 years ago, the glacial max, the area where we are right now was a dry, dry tundra. And there were boreal forests down in Maryland, but here it was just it. The Sagamonian was an interglacial period. And so we had saltwater, the Delaware was a saltwater tidal river. And Delaware passed, passed through at least nine glacial interglacial cycles. So that's gonna cover that for that period of time. Now we look at flow in the Delaware during major human activity from the present to about 200 years ago, 1823, 2023, industrial revolution. So changes in the Delaware. So we're talking about changes in water volume, changes in water quality. I'm sorry about the spelling errors. I fixed them on my other ones, but groundwater discharge from the coastal plain into the Delaware water, Delaware River. Now groundwater withdrawal is going on in the New Jersey coastal plain, so that's reversed some of the flow. The Delaware maximum flow during the drought of 1960 was severely depressed. The drought induced increased chloride concentrations in the Delaware River. The minimum flow, we're going to cover all these things, but I just want to introduce you to this. The Delaware minimum flow since the drought in the 1960s has been increased because of reservoir construction. The decreased water quality due to human and industrial waste. The river has gotten poor quality. We've got improved water quality due to you and me pushing our governments to have EPAs, DEPs, DERs. 
We've dredged a lot of islands in the river for ferry operations, for boating. We've dredged the bottoms for large ocean going ships. And we filled the lowlands with uh, uh, boils. So we're gonna take a look at how groundwater used to flow in New Jersey. So precipitation goes on this whole area. The recharge area for what's an aquifer that uh, many of the New Jersey um, Delaware River communities use, the recharge area is truly that area between just south of Princeton, that blue blurb on this map. And the flow went from there and the water discharged into the Delaware River. That's what it was like in the 1880s, 1890s. Then they started putting in production wells in all these river communities of New Jersey. And so now we've got a cone of depression. And if you take a look at this, you can see that in the southern Burlington County, Burlington Camden County area, water levels are about 20 feet above sea level. Today, water levels in that area, about 120 feet below sea level. So flow is going into these wells and the flow, where is the water coming from? Well, the water is coming for precipitation, but it's also thieving water out of the Delaware River. So now we get, and you can see that the contour lines are very close together on the northwest side of these three contour lines. And that means that the flow is very rapid. Whereas from the southeast side, they're very diffuse lines. So that's very slow flow of water. It's probably hard for some of you that don't deal with these type of maps, but this is just a high gradient versus a low gradient. And so this is a, the groundwater recharge area is now from the Delaware River and the groundwater withdrawal area is everything inside that negative 80 line. So if we put this on a perspective, you can see that the Delaware River, the groundwater is bigger than the topographic divide, which defines the basin. So we were getting water from areas outside that blue blob that's just to the east of Trenton is now supplying water to the Delaware River in the 1880s. So the definition of the river basin is the topographic divide, not the source area of the water. And now, because we've got this cone of depression, because of all the withdrawals going on in New Jersey, you can see that they're pulling water out of the Atlantic County area, east of the basin, and now that water is going into households industry and their sewage treatment treats the water and it goes back into the Delaware River. So they're still pulling water from outside the basin and it's going back into the Delaware River. So you, you, you had the Delaware River basin defined by the topography, but if we defined it by where the water comes from, that's a very difficult decision to do. This is a map of flow in the Delaware River and it's at Trenton. So if you go by the Calhoun Street Bridge, there's a water treatment plant. They take the water out of the Delaware River, process the water and they feed the city of Trenton and a few other communities with that water. And in the 1960s, there was a drought. And you can see that prior to the 1960s, the flow in the Delaware River during the summertime was between 100, 1,000 and 2,000 cubic feet per second. But when the drought occurred, the state of New Jersey, the state of Pennsylvania, the state of Maryland got very scared because Salem City's wells went salty. Cumberland County, shoreline wells went salty. The wells that were at the Navy base went salty. And so as a result, these, these states got together. New Jersey had the money, Pennsylvania had the land, 
So they put the two together and built reservoirs up in the Pocono Mountains. And so what happened during that drought, normally the saltwater front is at the Delaware River Memorial Bridge. That's where it's about 50 milligrams per liter chlorides. That's the definition. But because of the drought, there's little water flowing down the flowing down the Delaware River. So as a result, the salt water moves up the river. And it moved up to the Schuylkill River and a little bit upstream of the Schuylkill River. So they built reservoirs in northern New Jersey after the drought of the 1960s. And now in the summertime, if the river is too flow is too little, then they release water from those reservoirs to keep the salt water front in at the Delaware Memorial Bridge. And so this is changes and flows. Otherwise, they used to have in the 1700s, there used to be a place to ford in um, Trenton to go across the Delaware River. You can't do that because the flow at that time was a thousand cubic feet per second. Now it's two and 3,000 cubic feet per second during the summer. You don't want to ford it in the middle of the winter. It's too cold. You know what I mean? So that's some of the flow. If we take a look, these, this map of from Wilmington, Delaware to Trenton, 60, 70, 80, 90, 100, those are the mile markers in the Delaware River, just for a point of reference. And so down by Wilmington, it's mile marker 70. In other words, you're 70 miles from Cape Henlope and Cape May Point. And Trenton is 130 miles upstream. And so this chart up here shows that in 1967, the oxygen concentration in the Delaware River used to be, when you get down at, at 50 mile marker 50, it's on the order of five milligrams per liter. But by the time you get to mile marker 70, where the Christiana River discharges in, and all the sewage in the 1960s was going into the Delaware River, it was knocking the oxygen out of the water. And the same was true of what Philadelphia was doing, what Bristol was doing. So until you got to mile marker 110 north of, of Philadelphia upstream from it, the Delaware River, so much sewage was going in, the sewage has a tendency to attract all the oxygen out of the water. So fish that migrate up the D Delaware River have to hold their breath for 70 or for 40 miles. And that's not possible. So that was called an oxygen block. And so we instilled the organizations like the US EPA, the New Jersey DEP, the Pennsylvania DER, and collectively we suggested that they do something about this. So these organizations started about 1972-1973 and were able to by 1980 get the oxygen level in the river higher and then by 2003 the oxygen level is even higher and they're trying to raise it even more so just by building sewage treatment plants and treating this wastewater before i remember when i first moved to my community they said why can't we just dump the leaves in the delaware river we that's what we did all during the the uh revel or the world war ii why can't we do that now and they said, we don't know why, but the EPA won't let us. Well, the EPA had a good solid reason not to let you dump the leaves because the leaves need oxygen to um, decompose and they would just steal all the water, oxygen out of there. I had one job for the uh, Army Corps of Engineers, or the U.S. Navy. They wanted, the, the Army Corps of Engineers wanted to dredge the Delaware River a five, seven, five to 10 feet deeper the Philadelphia. So they wanted to know what was the geology underneath. Are we going to be dredging soil, clay, sand, rock? And so we were, we did a, a bunch of surveys to determine the sediment type on the bottom of the river. 
And we were going out of the Piney Point Marina, which is just on the north side of Camden with our boat every morning. And I was a 35, 38 year old man at the time. So that was five years ago. And, and so um, the woman who ran the marina was an 85 year old woman. And I, I said, have you been, how long have you been working here? She said, since I was a teenage girl. And I said, is the river cleaner today than it was when you were a child? And she says, oh my God, I would drink the water in the river today. This is in 1987, 1989. And I'm thinking this water is pretty filthy. And I said, why do you say that? She said, in the 30s, there were islands of feces going down the river. Wow. They used to get sick on the docks. Yeah. And so we have, with our government, have forced the cleanup of the river. Industry doesn't want to do that. Our, our local governments don't have the know-how to do that. You need a much larger government that tells a little town like Florence, New Jersey, or a little town like Bristol, PA, this is what you got to do to clean up your water. So what happened, the dissolved oxygen, they in, forced the sewage treatment plants to be installed in the late 60s, early 70s. And by the 90s, the dissolved oxygen concentration started to increase. And now 2020, the dissolved oxygen. Not only does that affect the dissolved oxygen, not only affect the migration of the shad fish, but also blue crabs started increasing. And the number of eagles started increasing because the number of fish were increasing. So they have food. And so it's this, you say, well, what the cleaning up the oxygen in the water? Why does that help the eagles? Well, they have to eat something. So these are all the things that have been done over the decades, over the centuries to clean up the Delaware River in 1739. Ben Franklin petitioned the Pennsylvania due to foul smells for pollution, 1769, first noted in the estuary. So Benjamin Franklin leaves money to build freshwater pipelines to Philadelphia. So there's a whole series of things that people have been doing for centuries to try to keep the Delaware River clean. If you were here, this is downtown Philadelphia in the upper left-hand side, and there used to be a Windmill Island. They removed Windmill Island. They first cut a slot through it so ferry boats could go between, Philad or between Camden and Philadelphia. Today, that same area is completely free of islands. So what used to be a 17-foot deep river Today is a 45 foot deep river. So it's more than doubled its depth during that period of time. If we take a look at the area from the Schuylkill River downstream, there used to be Tinicum Islands and Bill's Island, Billings Island, Hog Island, and a whole slew of islands. Today, that's where the airport is, all of those lands. So the Delaware River is not this mile and a half wide stream. It's a half a mile, three quarter of a mile wide stream. And we've got the airport on one side and we've got New Jersey on the other side. Dinicum Island is the only island that remains on this whole thing. And that's in the lower uh, lower map. You can see Dinicum Island, that spaghetti stream of an island. <clears throat> so the main channel, so we have an engineered bottom and so the natural depth of the river, if you look at the map or the chart on the lower right, you can see the natural depth was 17 to 24 feet deep. They started dredging in the Philadelphia area and they brought it down to 26 feet deep. And then by 1900, they had it down to 30 feet. By 1910 to 35, 42, with the onset of World War II, they had it down to 40 feet. So we've already doubled the depth of the river. And now they're trying to bring it down to 45 feet. So you have to think about a, a river, a river that's a shallow pan, 
there's a lot of friction on that. So the water doesn't flow up and down the river very much. But when you have a deep channel in there, you've reduced the friction. And so the flow comes in much better and the flow goes out much faster. And so you have higher tides and lower tides today because so much water can make it up and so much water can make it out. And so the tidal fluctuation today up in the Bordentown area is six, seven, eight feet. Uh, 200 years ago, it was four or five feet. And so those are differences just because we have changed, I'm not going to use the word, we have changed the, our needs for the use of the river. And so this is a, the red line represents what the river looked like 500 years ago, 200 years ago. But because we have channeled it, we've brought it down lower and lower and lower and deeper and deeper. And so you get more water flowing in and out of the the river. So we've had many dredging operations starting 1885 and going on, and there's they're dredging right now, right across from the Tully Town landfill. So what do they do with these dredge spoils? So you can see on this map in the lower left-hand corner above the word river morphology, you can see some brown areas. And those brown areas are the fill deposits from the Delaware River. Oops, excuse me. And this is what the river would have looked like before. And this is what it looks like today, or this is what it looked like, these fill deposits, but this would have been all blue water. And so you can see, and I don't have a defined map enough for Pennsylvania what is where their dredge spoils is. I only have it for Maryland. I know that uh, the, the airport, which is the area below this word Schuylkill River, um, but I know that, but there's probably areas down in Eddytown and up by the, um, where the, uh, the docks are Pins Landing and whatnot. I'm sure that some of that is fill deposit, but I just don't, I don't have maps of that. So I can't include that. We've hardened the shorelines of the river by adding riprap, adding corrugated steel walls. And what used to be beaches are now pebbly beaches. They used to be sandy beaches just because the, the big ships wash again. So these are changes that have occurred because of the Industrial Revolution. Now I'm going to look at from four to 11 million years ago during the Pensacan and the Bridgeton era. So this is a map of obviously New Jersey and Pennsylvania. And today we think of the Delaware River as coming from Easton, Phillipsburg, down through um, Lim Lam Lumbertville, Lumberton, Lambertville, to Lambertville, New Hope, down to Trenton. Then it makes this strong turn along the borderline between New Jersey and Pennsylvania. Well, there used to be a very large river called the Pensacan River that flowed from the Hudson River, the mouth of the Hudson River, across the state of New Jersey to the Delaware River. And then it flowed out to Delaware Bay. And the Schuylkill River and the non-tidal section of the Delaware River were just tributaries to the Pensacan River. And the Pensacan River was about 10 miles wide. It was a very large river. And it left its deposits on both the New Jersey and the Pennsylvania side of the river. And so that is the Pensacan River, and this is based on work done by Sanford, who is a New Jersey state geologist, an absolutely amazing character. And there is the today's Delaware River Basin. So this river just bypassed the whole basin, didn't even consider the basin as being an important component. <clears throat> and so there's the Pensacan River 
cutting across Trenton and the Delaware Memorial Bridge. And it's all a lot of depositional down in um, Maryland and Delaware. Then there's also the Bridgeton area river and it flowed, but it mostly, it flowed in the same general pattern. It's a little bit older than the Pensacan and it formed most of Southern Cape or Southern New Jersey coastal plain. And that was about eight to 11 million years ago. And this would have been the Pensacan river basins floodplain where it deposited its sediments. And there's the Delaware River Basin overlain on top of the what so this this was a river that was depositing outside of our basin and it was source area was outside of the Delaware River Basin. And so this river now it didn't flow as one wide river. It, when it initially, you see the word oldest on the north side of this area. So it started up there and it migrated towards Delaware Bay. And the same was true with the um, Pensac and it, it migrated towards Delaware Bay. So now we're going to look at Miocene and older rivers. I, I know th these words, Miocene, are, they're just words that you don't really need. But rivers that are 11 million to 100 million years old. And so the Cohansia, if you live in New Jersey, the Cohansia Aquifer is a big thing. But all the sediments on the New Jersey coastal plain are between the age of the Cohansia and the Potomac. So they're 15 to 100 million years old. And so I don't know how familiar you are with New Jersey, but you've probably heard of Mount Holly, Cherry Hill, Mount Laurel, Mount Ephraim, all those big mountains of New Jersey, which put the Poconos to shame. Um, those mountains, if you've ever been to Batstow, Batstow was an iron community in New Jersey. And the rainwater that falls on the ground would dissolve iron in the, uh, in the ground. And as that water would flow, to the Batstow River or many other rivers in New Jersey, it would upwell and come into the bottom of the river. Now you and I had stuffing for Christmas and we had, we had peanut butter and jelly sandwich for lunch and we eat food. And those carbohydrates are our source of energy. There's bacteria that take iron that's dissolved into water and they convert that dissolved iron into a precipitate of iron, to solid iron. And that, that makes the iron stone of Batstow. And it's a bacterial operation. They get their energy by converting aqueous phase iron into solid phase iron. And that's how they get their energy. And so that's why they always say that these units regenerate themselves because of the geobacters that are in the ground. And so you have to envision this 10, 15, 20 million years ago. These streams are now hardened with ironstone. And then erosion occurs, 10 million years worth of erosion. But that ironstone doesn't erode. So the top of Mount Holly, the top of Arnie's Mount, the top of Cherry Hill is all a layer of ironstone. That used to be a river bottom, but everything else is eroded away. And so that's so when they, when they draw the Clarksburg Mountains, which are just south of uh, Heightstown, um, these these are these are all features of ancestral rivers of the Delaware River Basin. But they have nothing to do with the Delaware River because the Delaware River doesn't exist. It's just water flowing out to the Atlantic on rivers that just don't exist today. This is a, uh, a picture of the, um, the, the newer, the, the aquifers of New Jersey. And there's 10 aquifers here in, 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 not here, in New Jersey. And you can see how in this area from the Delaware River, 
to the highest point in here, all of the clay layers just sort of disappear. Well, they at one time went over the state of Pennsylvania, not over completely, but they went 10, 20 miles. And, but all that has been eroded away. So you have to use your imagination. And I'm sure you've had enough of a misspent youth that you can use your imagination to figure out what this was like. But these, these units all came from someplace and it's just erosion of New Jersey erosion of Pennsylvania and all that sediment that eroded in Bucks County, Montgomery County, Lancaster County, and Hunterton County, they flowed out and they formed the New Jersey coastal plain from 10 to 100 million years ago. And <clears throat> so the, all these eroded sediments that you don't see but these see so when you pump water in Atlantic City, you're pulling from the Atlantic City eight foot eight hundred foot sand, but the water is actually coming from Hamilton. And when you're pumping water in the Winona Mount Laura or the upper PRM, the water is coming from the Delaware River. You're pulling it down the aquifers. A little bit goes through the clay units, but so it's a it's an interesting mix of things, and it gets more than the Delaware River study. Then there was a man named Green Greenman who was doing studies of the top, topographic surface of the bedrock in Philadelphia, and he was able to find these various streams in the bedrock surface. They've all been covered by the Pinsakin Formation and the um, the Trenton gravels and whatnot. And, but this is, the, the Schuylkill River is that long line heading towards the lower left, but these other rivers are just small rivers that existed at the time that the Newark Basin or the uh, New Jersey Coastal Plain was being formed. And those are the ancestral river valleys, and they just cut right across the Delaware River because the Delaware River is not even considered as it. And if you go up to the Tullytown, Florence area, the same set of rivers are just coming across the Wissahickon Schist and they're moving across and they just flow. And they only define them in the area of the river because it helps them dredge the river. That's why we know that information. The Triassic, this is the time when the dinosaurs were being born. These words like Paleozoic, Mesozoic, and Cenozoic, just think the word zoo, animals. So paleo means old animals. Meso means middle animal. And seno means new animals. So the new animals are mammals. The middle animals are dinosaurs. The old animals are fish and clams. That's all that they're talking about. So when they talk about Paleozoic, you don't have to be very smart. You can have, you know, as little education as I've got, and you can figure that out. So the Triassic is when the dinosaurs live, and your red beds, just north of here, up by Lambertville and around Princeton, those red beds, they're just Triassic um, those are the age of the dinosaurs. What happened was Africa was up against North America. And then Africa and Asia, Africa and Europe started to separate. And when they separated, you have mountains of North America and mountains of Africa, Europe. And you've got a little crack in there, 10 mile wide crack. And sediments are flowing into that crack and they're filling up the Newark Basin. So this is the Delaware River. This is water flow in Bucks County, Montgomery County, and Hunterton County and Mercer County. Flow is going into this basin. If we look at the Carboniferous to the Ordovician deposits 300 to 500 million years ago, again, North America is slammed up against Africa, so and Af the big mountain range. So everything is flowing to create the Poconos Mountains. So flow is completely in the other direction. And if we look at the Cambrian to Proterozoic, Proter just means 
almost animals, which are bacteria and the like. We have the North America Craton, which is the core of the United of the North America. And that flow is just, there's no trees on it and there's no plants on it, there's no animals, there's nothing here. And the flow is just radially away from the word North America and it just flows out to the shoreline. So the, um, the falls of the Delaware, those sandstones that form the falls of the Delaware, that's just sand that the beach, this whole brown area is surrounded by a beach and that that is what you're seeing here. So, um, so th this is the, the, the flow at that time. These sediments are there. It's just the North American craton, and it's just creating the, the, the uh, chicky sandstone. So in summary, we've got the Delaware River. It's, today it's a tidal, freshwater, regulated flow. We've dredged it to... It's treated for wastewater. We take water out of it for groundwater, for drinking supplies, and we put sewage water into it. hundred years ago, it was tidal. It was an open sewer, had a natural bottom of about 15 feet, and there was natural groundwater. 6,000 years ago, this section of the Delaware was non-tidal freshwater. 17,000, it was non-tidal permafrost. 100,000 years ago, tidal salt water, 10 miles wide, 70 feet deep, big sand deposits, 5 million years ago. So these summaries are just going to go over what I've got, and I'm already well over my time limit. So I'm going to leave it at that, and thank you very much. If you have any questions, I'd be happy. Do that in a certain way. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Pierre. That was fascinating, a different perspective than we usually have at our meetings. So uh, we have some problems with our microphones today. Normally, we have microphones out in the audience for people in the audience to ask questions, and those microphones broadcast out uh, into the virtual world, but those microphones aren't working. So what we have to do today is um, you... Those in person here, uh, ask your question, and then I'll repeat it into this microphone, which will broadcast out, and then Pierre will answer it. And then I'll switch, we'll, sw we'll alternate between uh, in person here, questions, and then questions via the chat in Zoom, which I'll read out. So who has a question? We'll, we'll start here. Yeah, yes. Pierre? Uh, could you repeat the question into the microphone? The question I'm um, asked is, how far did the glacier depress the land? And obviously in the Adirondacks, it was half a mile thick and it depressed at many hundreds of feet. Here, it maybe depressed it on the order of 100 feet, 75 feet. How high would the glacier have been? Um, the glacier in the Hudson Valley, because the Hudson Valley is so deep, might have been 500, 1,000 feet thick, whereas on the top of the Atlantic or the New Jersey Highlands or the Poconos, it might have been only 300 or 400 feet thick. So it has a tendency to flow. Glaciers have a tendency to flow in the in the deep areas faster and bigger and deeper. So, okay, um, I'm not seeing any questions via the chat. Uh, Fred, do you see any? Okay. A lot, um, a lot of uh, compliments, but no questions. Yes, sir. Oh. Uh, I understand a lot of the dredge in Smith Island and Windmill Island. That dredge in the 1890s, when they did the that dredge was carried down and filled with a lot to create more land down in the Navy Yard today, as well as uh, the Island Park. 
you may be well right. Uh, Could you repeat okay. that? The, the dredging from the islands between Camden and Philadelphia, that sediment, the gentleman said, was used down where the Navy base area is. And that may well be true. I don't know the specifics about disposal of materials. You really have to talk to the Army Corps of Engineers. I just know that there are spoils piles here, here, and here as defined by the New Jersey State Geologic Map. But where that sediment specifically came from, I don't know the answer. Yeah, originally, the island separated from the mainland down south north. So this man seems to know a great deal, and he's saying that Leg Leg League, League Island, FDR Park area, that sediment was disposed of in in the on the shorelines in, in Pennsylvania, or repurposed for fill material. Isn't that what happened in Hog Island in the airport? Well, that too. Okay, so there was a discussion here between a couple of the attendees that people out in the Zoom land couldn't hear. But um, anyway, we do have a, uh, I have a, a, a question via the chat. How does 45 feet deep but narrower a river today affect flooding? One, one of the advantages of a rainfall falling in a forest is that the rain hits the leaves, hits all the branches, hits all the trunks of the trees, hits the leaf litter on the ground. And so the rain might last for two or three hours, or maybe it lasts for a day. But hitting all these things, it, it just, they, they retard it getting into the aquifer. And then once it gets into the aquifer, it slowly moves to the stream. Now, when you remove the forests and you put in farm fields or you remove the farm fields and you put in urban environments, that rain hits macadam and that water then goes to the storm sewer and then that storm sewer leads it to this, the river. And so a rainfall that 200 years ago would make it to the river in two days, and then the river would rise and then depress in four more days. That water hits there, it's in the river an hour later, and so the river now rises quickly, and three hours later it falls quickly. So it's a so you end up with a a flow regime that's two days, three days long that looks like that 100 years ago. And today it looks like this. Same area underneath the curve, same amount of water leave, but the water comes up. And when you have a river that is much deeper and much wider and much narrower, the flow is, is generally because there's less friction on the walls of the, the water. It's hard to envision, but there's friction between the walls of the water. It's like putting water through a, uh, a rough surface or a, a smooth surface. Anyways, the water takes time and it just flows out much more quickly in a deep river because of less frat friction. So those are the, the considerations that one must look at. You can just okay. answer and yeah. just repeat the question though. Okay. Um, does like erosion or anything and when sediment and all goes into the river. Does that cause you have to like go back in and dredge some more or, you know, it's 45 feet yes. deep now. Yeah. Does that have to be checked on all the time to yeah. make sure it's deep enough for ships and yeah. all that are? Yeah, so the, the, the woman asked the question, 
do they have to redredge the Delaware River? Does what they dredged in the 1980s, um, do they have to redredge 40 years later, 20 years later? And the answer is yes, they have to. They have to maintain. Otherwise, sediments will build up at the mouth of the Schuylkill River, at the mouth of Pensacon River, because sediments are coming down there. And so, yes, they do have to redredge them to maintain that 45 foot deep channel or 40 foot deep channel. All right. So, uh, again, we're alternating uh, chat questions with in-person questions. So uh, somebody has a question, how can I learn about underground streams in Northeast Philadelphia? What sources? I'm assuming you don't know much about well, that. I can talk about there's there, underground streams is a misnomer that's let me mind. <laughs> okay. Under there, there, you know, underground streams happen in limestone environments. You you think of a you go look at Pennypack Creek, that's you can step over it, it's shin deep and it's a water. You go into the caves lore lore caverns or mammoth cave, and you'll see a stream flowing in those. That's not the way it works in Pennsylvania or New Jersey. Um, the water flows, it's sort of like if you have a, uh, a quart jar filled with sand, and it's just sand in it, you can still take that quart jar and you can pour a third of a jar of water into that jar of sand because all the air space in there is one third of the volume of that jar because the porosity of the sand the amount of air space in it is about one third of course the same thing could be said with clay in that a jar of clay is one third air too but clay has a an, an electrical attachment to, to water and so once you pour the water into the clay the clay absorbs it and you can't pour the water out. But once you pour it into the sand, you can just turn the jar upside down and turn the sand out. So underneath Philadelphia, there are all the streams that used to be here are now culverted. So if you're talking about culverted streams that are now in a storm sewer, um, you can find those on old maps and the city has those type of maps. If you're talking about a, what you would think of as a void in a stream, I, I hear it all the time in New Jersey, that the water down in Hamilton or um, Bar Stone Harbor, that comes from a river from the Poconos. No, that's not correct. It does not come from a river from the Poconos. It depends upon how deep it is, but it's just a, a sand, a, a, a zone of sand that has water in the sand, interspatial spaces of the sand. Uh, I will just add, the one type of underground stream that Pierre was talking about, uh, streams that were basically converted into sewers or culverted, uh, there's the world expert on that in Philadelphia is Adam Levine, uh, who's the historical consultant to the Philadelphia Water Department, uh, who has given talks uh, on that very subject with us before. Uh, his website used to be called Philly H2O. What's it called now, Fred? What? Water History PHL. Okay, so his website is Water History PHL, I guess, dot org. Yeah. Um, and so for the person asking about that, if you go to that site, you will find out everything you'll ever want to know about underground streams in Philadelphia that were originally, uh, you know, ground streams that were converted into sewers. Okay, uh, Dan, you want to? The, the, the uh, graph that you showed that the interglacial maximum and minimum over 800,000 years, how do geologists know that? Um, how, how, what is your data from? Okay. And I have no fault on And the answer to your question. Is, okay, his question was on this figure right here. How do they know that the yellow areas are warm periods and the blue areas are cold periods? And the way they know that, the way they know that is they take ice cores 
from the glaciers in in Greenland and South and Alaska and and uh, Antarctica, and they measure the amount of carbon dioxide that's in bubbles in the ice. So when that when that snow falls down, it's got atmospheric carbon dioxide in it. And the amount of carbon dioxide that's in the snow is a function of the amount of carbon dioxide that is generated by trees and animals. And so that gets stored in bubbles in the ice. So they take these ice cores and they analyze the amount of carbon dioxide in each millimeter or meter of it. And then they're able to come up with this curve. And this is, so that's how that is done. And uh, off topic question, do storms tend to follow the geological conditions? They're, they're modified from it in that do storms follow geologic formations? Do, you know, I grew up on the Champlain Valley. Storms would go up the Champlain, Lake Champlain, or they'd come down Champlain because they were stuck between the Green Mountains of Rot and the Adirondacks. And so they were, mod and then there, the people say the storms travel up the Delaware River. And I see that, you know, there's, I talked about catabatic winds, there's orogenic winds or orogeny is the mountain building sequence. So when you talk about the snows of Utah or the snows of the Sierra Nevadas, rain is coming off of the Pacific Ocean and then it hits that mountain and the, the, it can't go through the mountain can't go around the mountain, so it goes over the mountain. And as it goes up, it gets colder and colder and colder. And you hit the dew point, and the rain falls out of there. That's why, you know, cumulus clouds are flat on the bottom. The, the warm, wet air rises, and it hits a certain point. That's the dew point. And that's why the clouds flatten the bottom and fluffy up above it just because of the, the dew point being. Well, the, the reason I asked you to make sure Storm yeah. So yeah, and and they're probably modified. I'm not really. I'm a better geologist than I'm, I I am a climatologist. But I, you know, yes, I've heard the same thing. But you, you know, when a storm comes from the south, is it being f functioned by the Appalachian Mountains, or is it a function of the fact that it's coming up from the south? And, uh, <clears throat> we have another question uh, via chat. How old are the New Jersey Pinelands rivers, Rancocas, Batso, and Mullica, et cetera? Um, well, the, the sediment that's there is 10 million years old, so they have to be younger than that. And um, during the last interglacial period, you see these rivers, um, or during the last glacial period, this was all tundra. So they didn't even flow at all then. So if a river's not flowing, is it a river? Uh, you know, you're, now we're talking academically. Um, a lot of the rivers, if you look at them, you know, if you go up to Crosswicks Creek, which is between Bordentown and Trenton, the river is... 20 feet wide, it's in a valley that's 150, 200 feet wide. Why would the river be so small in such a big valley? And so what the reason is, is when the glacial melt would occur, phenomenal volumes of water would come down and they would carve a very large valley. You'll see the same thing out in the, in the Pine Barrens, a lot of places, the, the river is this wide, you know, is a foot and a half wide and an inch deep, and it's in a valley that's 50 feet wide. And that's because historically that lowland was uh, a storm runoff from some major feature. So river, you can't judge a river by what it is today. You have to look at it ancestrally during the, the, the major storms. 
I mean, 1955, when a hurricane came through, it tore out every single bridge in Gloucester County. They had to, all, there's no bridge older than 1955 in Gloucester County because they're all destroyed. Uh, they just underspent the size of the bridge so. All right, we have time for one more. Anybody? Okay. Uh, yeah. uh, 100,000 years from now, we will be in Galatia again. Yeah. Uh, and then when we come out of the glacier back in time this period, will those creeks and rivers be kind of in the same condition? Kind. Okay. His question was right now we're in interglacial period. In the, you know, we're going to finish out this interglacial period, this warming, and then we will go back into another glacial period. Since the glacial periods are controlled by the sun and the moon and the planets, um, will we will we end up having another? Will the rivers be in the same place? <laughs> you know, I was working down in Cape May County, and a lot of the streams in Cape May County. Um, they're a foot wide and three inches deep. And all you have to do is have one tree fall down on it and it dams up and the stream is now a hundred feet over there just because the land is so flat. And so the streams are migrating constantly and highways get put in and people do things. So will they be in, they'll be in relatively same place, but, you know, but they'll move around. All right. Thank you, everybody here in, in Zoomland. Thank you. Yeah. And um, just a reminder, I forgot to announce at the outset that the way we communicate with everybody is through our list serve, our email, uh, or our Facebook page. So uh, a sign-in sheet went around uh, uh, for those out on Zoom, nephillyhistory at gmail.com. If you email us, we will put you on our email list and you'll get uh emails about our activities, or you follow our Facebook page, the North, uh, Northeast Philadelphia History Network Facebook page, and like that page, and then all announcements of our activities are there as well. And um, <clears throat> I did want to mention that we're having uh, desserts and treats afterwards, so please stick around for that, and uh, thank you all for coming. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah.